now to uh, chapter 22, uh, which is uh, actually um, for module number 16. So the topic is on uh, insurance uh, contract. Now for the objectives, uh, we have the following. Number one, identify the parties in an insurance contract and also state the essential elements of such contract. Number two, compare its type of insurance risks. And three, explain its type of insurers or insurance contracts. Okay, so these are now your objectives uh, in the study of uh, our uh, insurance contract. Okay, so we now go to insurance contract, uh, PS, uh, PR, FRS 4 defines an insurance contract as a contract under which one party called the insurer accepts significant insurance risk from another party, the policyholder, by agreeing to compensate the policyholder or a specified uncertain future event, the insured event adversely affects the policy holder. So adversely affects the policy holder. PFRS 4 provides the definitions for the following term. Insurer, the party that has an obligation under an insurance contract to compensate a policy if an insured event occurs. Policyholder, a party that has a right to compensation under an insurance contract if an insured event occurs. And insured event, an uncertain future event that is covered by an insurance contract and creates insurance risk. So these three are the very important terms that we have to remember in connection with our study of insurance contract. Okay, the definition of an insurance contract determines which contracts are within the scope of PFRS 4 rather than the other PFRS. Thus, an entity shall apply PFRS 4 to all policies it issues or holds that falls within the definition of insurance contract as provided under PFRS 4. So, as provided under PFRS for the essential elements in the definition of an insurance contract. One, transfer of significant insurance risk. There is transfer of significant insurance risk from the insured policy holder to the insurer, the insurance provider. Number two, payment from the insured. That's the premium. Generally, the insured pays to a common fund from which losses are paid. However, not all insurance contracts have explicit premiums, such as insurance covered bundled with some credit card contracts. Three, indemnification against loss. The insurer agrees to indemnify the insured or other beneficiaries against loss or liability from specified events uh, or circumstances called an insured event that may occur or be discovered during a specified period. Then we have significant insurance risk. Risk or uncertainty is a fundamental element of an insurance contract. At least one of the following is uncertain at the inception of an insurance contract. So one or at least one of the following is 
uncertain. A, the occurrence of an insured event, uh, that may be one of the uncertain uh, events. Uh, B, the timing of the event, or C, the level of indemnification that the insurer will need to pay the insured if the event occurs. Now, risk is the possibility of loss or injury when an uncertain future event occurs. Risk can be a uh, letter A, speculative risk, one that can result in either gain or loss, such as fluctuation in the prices of commodities. B, pure risk, one that can produce a loss only. And uh, we have an insurance risk other than financial risk transferred from the holder of a contract to the issuer. The risk must be pre-existing at the time the insurance contract was executed. A new risk created by the contract is not insurance risk. Insurance risk is significant if an insured event could cause an insurer to pay significant additional benefits in any scenario, excluding scenarios that lack commercial substance. Additional benefits refer to amounts that exceed those that would be payable if no insured event occurred. A contract that transfers only an insignificant insurance risk may not be accounted for under PFRS 4. Such contracts shall be accounted for under other relevant PFRS. Financial risk is the risk of a possible future change in one or more of a special interest rate financial instrument price, commodity price, foreign exchange rate, index of prices or rates, credit rating or credit risk or other variable provided in the case of a non-financial variable that the variable is not specific to a party to the contract. A contract that exposes the issuer to financial risk without significant insurance risk is not an insurance contract. From the definitions above, insurance risk includes only pure risk. If both significant insurance risk and financial risk are present, the contract will be classified as an insurance contract. So for that, purpose. Okay, so we have now an insurance. In addition uh, of financial risk, the following risks are also not insurance risk. Letter A, lapse or persistency risk. The risk that the counterpart will cancel the contract earlier or later than the issuer had expected in pricing the contract, either or later than the issuer had expected in pricing the contract. This is not insurance risk because the payment to the counterparty is not contingent on an uncertain future event that adversely affects the counterparty. B, expense risk. The risk of unexpected increases in the administrative cost associated with the servicing of a contract rather than in cost associated with insured events. This is not insurance risk because an unexpected increase in expenses does not adversely affect the counterparty. Now, the legal principles of insurance. Uh, here, the principal objective of every insurance contract is to provide financial protection to the insured in case of occurrence of an uncertain future event. 
neither the insured nor the insurer shall misuse an insurance contract to unjustify, unjustly enrich himself at the expense of the other. Now we have the following principles. Principle of insurance interest of utmost good faith. Uh, we have now your obrime fide, principle of an indemnity, principle of contribution. We have the types of insurance, insurers, government insurance operated and regulated by the government, such as the GSIS, extending life insurance to government employees and social security system or SSS, extending life insurance to employees or employers in the private sector and other voluntary members. Propriety insurance owned by stockholders and operated for profit. Policyholders are not among the owners of the business. Mutual insurance owned by the policyholders themselves who elect the board of directors like a cooperative insurance. We have the types of insurance contracts. A one direct insurance contract for purposes of applying PFRS for insurance contracts may be classified as direct insurance contract where the insurer directly accepts risk from the insured and assumes the sole obligation to compensate the insured and assumes the sole obligation to compensate the insured in case of a loss event. PFRS 4 defines a direct insurance contract as a an Okay, an insurance contract that is not a reinsurance contract. That is not a reinsurance contract. Reinsurance contract, reinsurance contract, an insurance contract issued by one insurer, uh, the insurer, to compensate another insurer, the sedent, for losses on or more contracts, uh, one or more contracts issued by the sedent. The relevant items, reinsurer is the party that has an obligation under a reinsurance contract to compensate a sedent if an insured event occurs. Sedent is a policyholder under the reinsurance contract. Types of reinsurance contracts, one is proportional, the sedent and the reinsurer share on the premiums and claims in proportion to the risk assumed. Pro proportional insurance contracts may either be treaty or obligatory. The insurer shares in all risk arising from all the insurance policies issued by the sedent that are within the scope of the reinsurance contracts. Two, facultative, specific. The reinsurer shares only on specific risks on individual insurance policies ceded by the sedent. B, we have the non-proportional excess of loss uh, reissuance. Excess of loss reissuance. So we have now your pro non-proportional. In cases of loss events, the reinsurer is obliged to pay only for claims exceeding a predetermined amount, also known as the sedan's retention limit or net retention. So we have, next we have liability acquiescence, adequacy test. At each reporting period, an insurer shall assess whether it's recognized 
liabilities are adequate using current estimates of future cash flows and related items such as handling costs arising under the insurance contract. If the assessment shows that the carrying amount of the insurance liabilities less related deferred acquisition cost and related intangible assets is inadequate compared to the current estimate, the deficiency is recognized in profit or loss. So we now use this carrying amount of insurance liability, less related deferred acquisition cost and related intangible assets it is less than the current estimate of insurance liability at end of reporting period. This is equal to or the difference is equal to the deficiency of insurance liability recognized in profit or loss. So we have this guide. If the insurance accounting policies do not require do not require a liability adequacy test to be carried out as described above, then, then an assessment is still required of the potential net liability, such as the relevant insurance liabilities, less any related deferred acquisition cost. In these circumstances, the insurer is required to recognize at least the amount that would be required to be recognized as a provision under PES 37 provisions, contingent liabilities, and assets. Any deficiency in insurance liability is also recognized in profit and loss. PFRS 4 provides the following definitions. Insurance liability and insurers net contractual obligations under an insurance contract. Insurance asset and insurer, insurers net contractual rights under an insurance contract. And reissuance reinsurance uh, assets as sedans net contractual rights under a reinsurance uh, contracts. Now these are the very important terms that uh, we have to be familiar with in connection with uh, our insurance contracts. So we have a lot of these uh, terms uh, take note that each of these is very important in connection with our uh, consideration for uh, the term insurance uh, contract, for the term insurance contract. Okay, now we have uh, mentioned in the handouts, we have uh, significant insurance risk and we also have the legal principles of insurance. The legal principles of insurance. Now, talking about the legal principles of insurance, we have four. We have the principle of insurance interest, the principle of out at most good faith, the principle of indemnity, and the principle of contribution. Now, with regards to principle of insurable interest, principle of insurable interest, uh, the insured must have an insurable interest in the property or life insured. So, principle of insurable interest. Now, that's the first legal principle of insurance. 
a uh, principal insurable interest meaning the insured must have insurable interest in the property or life insured uh, we can say that the insured has an insurable interest if he is benefited by the property's existence so the insured has an insurable interest if he is benefited by the property's existence and prejudiced by its destruction okay so that uh, in that case we can say that the insured has an insurable interest the existence of an insurable interest is a requisite to the legal enforcement of an insurance contract so the existence of an insurable interest is a requisite to the legal enforcement of an insurance contract in order to prevent the deliberate destruction in order to prevent the deliberate destruction of life or property in order to prevent the deliberate destruction of life or property for profit in order to prevent the deliberate destruction of life or property for profit okay now second is principle of utmost good faith the principle of utmost good faith uh, in other words all insurance contracts must be negotiated with utmost honesty and fairness all insurance contracts must be negotiated with utmost honesty and fairness because the contracting parties because the contracting parties do not have the same access to relevant information because uh, because the contracting parties do not have the same access to relevant information so in this connection uh, see to it that material facts must be disclosed material facts must be disclosed then we go to the third principle principle of indemnity principle of indemnity it means that the insured is compensated for the loss he incurred the insured is compensated for the loss he incurred the insured is compensated for the loss he incurred and reverted back and reverted back to his previous financial condition and reverted back to his previous financial condition and reverted back to his previous financial condition before the occurrence of the loss before the occurrence of the loss okay before the occurrence of the loss this does not apply to life insurance this does not apply to life insurance this does not apply to life insurance now we have to understand that the value of human life cannot be measured in monetary terms so this does not apply to life insurance as we have to understand 
that the value of human life cannot be measured in monetary terms. And the last is the principle of contribution. This is a consequence of the principle of indemnity. This is a consequence of the principle of indemnity. This is a consequence of the principle of indemnity. It applies, it applies when the insured obtains insurance. It applies when the insured obtains insurance from more than one insurer. It applies when the insured obtains insurance for, from more than one insurer. It applies when the insured obtains insurance from more than one insurer. In case of loss, in case of loss, the insured can only claim compensation. In case of loss, the insured can only claim compensation for the actual losses he incurred. In case of loss, the insured can only claim compensation for the actual losses he incurred from either insurer, from either insurer, or both insurers, from either insurer or both insurers on a proportionate basis. From either insurer or both insurers on a proportionate basis. There is no double compensation. There is no double compensation for actual losses incurred. There is no double compensation for the actual losses incurred. In other words, you cannot collect from uh, this uh, insurance companies in a double uh, situation or in a double manner. Okay, now the last which is not included in the list of the principles. Now will you add principle of sub subrogation? Principle of, or we still have uh, three more which are not included. Principle of subrogation. So number five, to be added, among the principles of insurance, we still have five, six, and seven. Number five is principle of subrogation. S-U-B-R-O-G-A-T-I-O-N. Uh, principle of subrogation. Is an extension and another consequence of the principle of indemnity. This is an extension and another consequence of the principle of indemnity. This is an extension and another consequence of the principle of indemnity. Subrogation means substituting one entity. Subrogation means substituting one entity such as the insurer. Subrogation means su substituting one entity such as the insurer for another entity 
such as the insured. Okay, subrogation means substituting one entity such as the insurer for another entity such as the insured. The legal right, the legal right to collect a debt or damages. The legal right to collect a debt. The legal right to collect a debt or damages. The legal right to collect a debt or damages. Next, let's continue. Uh, we will have some uh, examples of these uh, principles after. Number five principle is principle of loss minimization. Principle of loss minimization. Okay? What do we mean by this? In cases of sudden loss, in cases of sudden loss, events like fire, in cases of sudden loss with events like fire, the insured should try his best. The insured should try his best to minimize the loss to minimize the loss of his insured property to minimize the loss of his insured property by taking all necessary steps by taking all necessary steps by taking all necessary steps to control and reduce the losses to control and reduce the losses and save what is left of the property and save what is left of the property. Okay? This prevents the insured from neglecting the loss event just because the property is insured. This prevents the insured from neglecting the loss event just because the property is insured. Then we go to principle number seven, principle of proximate cause, causa proxima, principle of proximate cause when a loss is caused by more than one event when a loss is caused by more than one event the closest cause the closest cause that's why you say proximate the closest cause not the furthest cause the closest cause, not the furthest cause, is taken into consideration. Is taken into consideration when determining the extent of the liability. When determining the extent of the liability. Again, this principle does not apply to life insurance. Again, this principle does not apply to life insurance. This principle does not apply to life insurance. Okay? Now, Let's take up some, uh, some examples on how to illustrate these different principles. We begin with example number one. John is an employee. Sample number one. John is an employee. 
as part of his benefits. As part of his benefits. He has two insurances. He has two insurances acquired by his employer. He has two insurances acquired by his employer from PhilHealth. He has two insurances acquired by his employer from PhilHealth and from a care insurance company. From PhilHealth and from CARE, C-A-R-E, CARE, insurance company. Uh, we have to understand that the PhilHealth is uh, a must required by the government, while the employer at his discretion got the CARE insurance company. Okay, continue. Each of these insurances, each of these insurances states clearly the types of sicknesses insured. Each of these insurances states clearly the types of sicknesses insured. The accredited hospitals, the accredited hospitals, the amount of compensation, the amount of compensation, the insurances are bound to indemnify. The amount of compensation, the insurances are bound to indemnify in cases of sickness in cases of sickness and all other relevant information and all other relevant information okay so let's begin with the principle of insurable interest the first principle applicable is the principle of insurable interest. The insurable interest is John's health. The insurable interest is John's, G-O-H-N, John's health. John is the insured. The insurable interest is his health. So that's the first principle the second principle is principle of utmost good faith the full disclosure of all material facts the full disclosure of all material facts is an application of this principle the full disclosure of all material facts. The full disclosure of all material facts is an application of this principle. The full disclosure of all material facts is an application of this principle. Okay, continue. A year later, a year later, John had an appendectomy. A year later, John had an appendectomy involving the surgical removal, involving the surgical removal of his appendix. A year later, John had an appendectomy involving the removal of his appendix. 
this is covered under both health insurances. This is covered under both health insurances. The accredited hospital billed John a total of 65,000 pesos. The accredited hospital billed John a total of 65,000 pesos. 20,000 is paid by PhilHealth. 20,000 is paid by PhilHealth and the balance by care insurance. 20,000 is paid by PhilHealth and the balance is paid by care insurance. Okay? So the bill of 65,000, 20,000 was paid by PhilHealth and 45,000 was paid by care insurance. Paid by care insurance. The principles applicable are Principle of indemnity. Principle of indemnity. John is indemnified only up to the extent of 65,000. John is indemnified only up to the extent of 65,000. John did not gain from this operation. John did not earn again from this operation. So, principle of indemnity. Another principle applicable to this is principle of contribution. Principle of contribution. Both insurers shared in indemnifying John. Both insurers shared in indemnifying John for the cost he incurred. Both insurers shared in indemnifying John for the cost he incurred. But he did not collect twice, but he did not collect twice. That's why he did not earn profit from these claims from the insurance companies. So far, we have uh, illustrated principle of insurable interest, utmost good faith, indemnity and contribution okay another problem continue a year after his appendectomy a year after his appendectomy john decided to change career a year after his appendectomy john decided to change career he opened a new business he opened a new business that was a success after operating for only one year he opened a new business that was a success after operating for only one year. He opened a new business that was a success after operating for only one year. John was able to save enough money. John was able to save enough money and put up a house and put up a house 
Jan was able to save money and put up a house. He insured his house for 2 million pesos. He insured his house for 2 million pesos. After a year, after a year, his house was totally destroyed by fire. After a year, his house was totally destroyed by fire. The insurance company paid John two million. The insurance company paid John two million. And at the same time, John filed a lawsuit against his neighbor. Uh, and at the same time, John filed a lawsuit against his neighbor who was responsible for the occurrence of fire and filed a lawsuit against his neighbor who was responsible for the occurrence of fire and asked payment for 2.4 million. And asked payment for 2.4 million, which is the fair value of the house. And asked payment for 2.4 million, which was the fair value of the house. Okay? So we have now the principle applicable is the principle of subrogation. The principle of subrogation. John's right to claim damages from his neighbor. John's right to claim damages from his neighbor is transferred to the insurance company. Jan's right to claim damages from his neighbor is transferred to the insurance company. Okay? If the case filed against the neighbor will win and the collection of 2.4 million will be made if the case filed against the neighbor will win and collects 2.4 million from the neighbor the insurance company should get the 2 million should get the two million. The balance is the only amount paid to Jan. The balance is the only amount paid to Jan. Okay? So this means that the insurer can benefit out of subrogation rights only up to the amount paid to the insured plus other direct costs incurred. Okay, so we have now uh, example number three. An earthquake caused an electrical post to collapse. An earthquake caused an electrical post to collapse. An earthquake caused an electrical post to collapse, which caused which caused a short circuit that caused fire to a building, which caused a short circuit that caused fire to the building, to a building. 
that cause fire to a building. The building's fire insurance coverage. The building's fire insurance coverage. The building's fire insurance coverage does not explicitly extend to earthquakes. The building's fire insurance coverage does not explicitly extend to earthquakes. When determining the extent of the insurer's liability, the closest cause to the destruction of the building, which is fire, which the closest cause to the destruction of the building, which is the fire, must be taken into consideration. Must be taken into consideration. So we have the principle of proximate cause. Principle of proximate cause. Okay, so these are the different principles applicable uh, to insurance contracts. And we have the types of insurance contracts, namely treaty and facultative for the proportional and non-proportional types of reinsurance contracts. For the types of insurance contracts, we have direct and reinsurance, reinsurance contract. Okay, so we have uh, here uh, an example of direct insurance contract. Example of direct insurance contract. X obtained fire insurance for his house from a insurance company. X obtained fire insurance for his house from a insurance company. In case of fire, a insurance company, a com insurance company shall be liable in compensating X. A insurance company shall be liable in compensating X for the losses incurred. Now this is an example of direct insurance contract. Okay, another example. A insurance company, a insurance company is concerned, is concerned about possible losses on the insurance. A insurance company is concerned about possible losses on the insurance contract with Mr. Juan. A insurance company is concerned about possible losses on the insurance contract with Mr. Juan. Thus, A insurance company obtains insurance from X insurance company. A insurance company obtains insurance from X insurance company for protection, for protection against possible losses, for protection against possible losses on the insurance contract with Mr. Juan. For protection against possible losses on the insurance contract 
with Mr. One. In case of fire, in case of fire, in case of fire, a insurance company shall compensate Mr. Juan. In case of fire, a insurance company shall compensate Mr. Juan, but this time a insurance company can claim compensation can claim compensation from x insurance company okay but this time a insurance company can claim compensation from x insurance company now this is an example of a reinsurance contract so it's described as insurance of an insurance a insurance company is referred to as the sedan or primary insurer while x insurance company is referred to as the re insurer again this is an example of a reinsurance contract simply described as insurance of an insurance a insurance company is referred to as the sedan or primary insurer while x insurance company is referred to as reinsurer by entering into the reissue insurance contract a insurance company is managing the risk of loss from the direct insurance contract with mr one by entering into the reinsurance contract a insurance company is managing the risk of loss from the direct insurance contract with Mr. Juan. Tadyo ito, sino ito? Diri ka lang, hindi ka magwa. Assuming that only 40% of the risk, assuming that only 40% of the risk accepted from Mr. Juan is ceded to X insurance company. The other 60% risk retained by A insurance company is referred to as the retention limit. Is referred to as the retention limit or net retention. Is referred to as the retention limit or net retention the 40 percent risk ceded to x insurance company is referred to as the session session c e double -S, s i o n the 40 percent risk ceded to x insurance company is referred to as the session c e double -S, s i o n okay another case assume that x insurance company also obtains insurance from another reinsurer assume that x insurance company also obtains insurance from another insurer one insurance company one you o n e one insurance company for protection against possible losses for protection 
against possible losses from the reinsurance contract with ABC Insurance Company. Assume that X Insurance Company also obtains insurance from another reinsurer, one ONE Insurance Company for protection against possible losses from the reinsurance contract with a insurance company. This is an example of retro session. R E T R O C E S I O N. This is an example of retro session. Described as three insurance of a reinsurance. Described as reinsurance of a reinsurance. Described as reinsurance of a reinsurance. One insurance company, one insurance company is referred to as the retrocessionaire. One insurance company is referred to as the retrocessionaire. And the risk transferred is referred to as retrocession. This is referred to as retrocessionaire. And the risk transferred to is referred to as retrocession. Referred to as retrocession. Okay? So we have now your different types of uh, insurance or the principles for this purpose. Okay. For the examples, of uh, insurance uh, contracts, insurance contracts may be uh, proportional, it may be proportional, or it may be non-proportional. So that if it is proportional, then we have either the treaty or the facultative. And the other one is non-proportional for the types of reinsurance contracts. Okay. Then for the examples of insurance contracts, we have a lot of these insurance contracts. And we have uh, PFRS4 provides the following examples of insurance contracts. If the transfer of insurance risk is significant. So the types of insurance contracts. If the transfer of insurance risk is significant. A. Insurance against theft or damage to property. Insurance against theft or damage to property. B. Insurance against product liability, professional liability, civil liability, or legal expenses. So insurance against product, professional, or civil liabilities. C, life insurance and prepaid funeral plans. Life insurance and prepaid funeral plans. D, life contingent annuities and pensions. Life contingent annuities and pensions. E, 
disability and medical coverage. Disability and medical coverage. F, surety bonds, fidelity bonds, performance bonds, and bid bonds. Bid, B-I-D. F, surety bonds, fidelity bonds, performance bonds, and bid bonds. Contracts that provide compensation if another entity fails to perform a contractual obligation. So uh, the meaning of these types, uh, contracts which provide compensation if another party fails to perform a contractual obligation. For example, an obligation by one party to construct a building, but that party failed. So, for example, an obligation of one party to construct a building, and that obligation failed. So, you have to ask payment from the insurer. G. Credit insurance. Credit insurance. This uh, meet the definition of a financial guarantee contract. Credit insurance contracts meet the definition of a financial guarantee contract, which is within the scope of PFRS 9, which is within the scope of PFRS 9 and PAS 2. PFRS 9 and PAS 32. PFRS 9 and PAS 32. These contracts may only be accounted for these contracts may only be accounted for under PFRS 4. These contracts may only be accounted for under PFRS 4 if the issuer, if the issuer has previously asserted, if the issuer has previously asserted, if the issuer has previously asserted explicitly, asserted explicitly that it regards, that it regards such contracts, that it regards such contracts as insurance contracts, as insurance contracts, and has used accounting applicable to insurance contract. And has used accounting applicable to insurance contracts. And has used accounting applicable to insurance contracts. PFRS 4. PFRS 4 defines a financial guarantee contract. PFRS 4 defines a financial guarantee contract as one that requires the issuer. PFRS 4 defines a financial guarantee contract as one that requires the issuer requires the issuer to make specified payments requires the issuer to make specified payments to reimburse the holder for a loss it incurs to reimburse the holder 
for a loss to reimburse the holder for a loss it incurs because a specified debtor because a specified debtor fails to make payment because a specified debtor fails to make payment when due specified debtor fails to make payment when due in accordance with the original when due in accordance with the original or modified terms in accordance with the original or modified terms of a debt instrument of a debt instrument so we have your letter g credit insurance then we go to letter h we have product warranties product warranties issued by another party for goods sold by a manufacturer dealer or retailer product warranties issued by another party for goods sold by a manufacturer dealer or retailer now these product warranties are outside the scope of pfrs4 but they are within the scope of pfrs15 so these product warranties are outside the scope of pfrs4 but they are within the scope of pfrs 15 and pes 37 and pes 37 then we go to letter i title insurance title insurance so we have the insurance against defects in title to land uh, we have the insurance against defects in title in title to land that were not apparent that were not apparent when the insurance contract was written that were not apparent when the insurance contract was written the insured event is the discovery of a defect in the title the insured event is the discovery of a defect in the title the insured event is the discovery of a defect in the title not the defect itself so what's important is the discovery of a defect in the title next letter j still we are discussing examples of insurance contracts letter j travel assistance travel assistance for losses uh, suffered while the insured is traveling travel assistance for losses suffered while the insured is traveling next letter k catastrophe bonds catastrophe c a t a s t r o p h e catastrophe bonds that provide for reduced payments that provides for reduced payments of principal interest or both 
So catastrophe bonds that provide for reduced payments or principal and interest or both if a specified event if a specified event adversely affects the issuer of the bond if a specified event adversely affects the issuer of the bonds if a specified event adversely affects the issuer of the bonds unless the specified event unless the specified event does not create significant insurance risk unless the specified event does not create significant insurance risk uh, for example if the event is just a change in the interest rate or the foreign exchange rate so it does not create significant insurance risk then letter l insurance swap insurance swap is wap and other contracts that require a payment insurance swaps and other contracts that require a payment based on changes that requires a payment based on changes in climatic climatic geological or other physical variables climatic geological and other physical variables that are specific to a party to the contract that are specific to a party to the contract and letter m is reinsurance contracts reinsurance contracts okay pfrs4 provides the following examples of items that are not insurance contracts the following are examples of items that are not insurance contracts not insurance contracts so letter a is not an insurance contract investment contracts that have the legal form of an insurance contract but do not expose the insurer to significant insurance risk for example your life insurance contracts in which the insurer bears no significant mortality risk such as non-insurance financial instruments or service contracts so the following are examples of items that are not not insurance contracts so letter a investment contracts b contracts that have the legal form of insurance but pass all b contracts that have the legal form of insurance but pass p a s s all significant insurance risk but pass all significant insurance risk back to the policy holder but pass all significant insurance risk back to the policy holder back to the policy holder 
through non-cancellable, through non-cancellable, through non-cancellable and enforceable mechanisms. Non-cancellable and enforceable mechanisms that adjust future payments, that adjust future payments by the policy holder, that adjust future payments by the policy holder as a direct result of insured losses. As a direct result of insured losses. Letter C, self-insurance. Self-insurance. Retaining a risk that could have been covered by insurance. Self-insurance. There is no contract because there is no agreement with another party. Self-insurance. Letter D, contracts that require payment. If an uncertain event occurs but do not require as a contractual precondition for payment that the event adversely affects the policy holder. So contracts such as gambling contracts, contracts such as gambling contracts that require payment if a specified uncertain future event occurs, but do not require as a contractual precondition for payment that the event adversely affects the policy holder. Letter E, derivatives that exposes one party to financial risk but not insurance risk because they require that party to make payment based solely on changes in one or more of a specified interest rate financial instrument price, commodity price, foreign exchange rate, index of prices, or rates, credit rating or credit index or other variables provided in the case of a non-financial variable that the variable is not as specific to uh, a party to the contract. So letter A, derivatives. Letter F, a credit-related guarantee or letter of credit requiring payments even if the holder has not incurred a loss requiring payments even if a party or the holder has not incurred a loss on the failure of the debtor to make payments when due if on the failure of the debtor to make payments when due Next, letter G, contracts that require a payment based on climatic, geological, or other physical variable that is not specific to a party to the contract. Usually, these are described as weather derivatives whether w e a t h e r whether derivatives 
letter H, catastrophe bonds that provide for reduced payments of principal, interest, or both based on climatic, geological, or other physical variable that is not specific to a party to the contract. Now take note that under uh, types of insurance contracts, we also have this here uh, under PFRS 4, stating that the following are not insurance contracts. Now take note of the differences. Okay, so we have now the types of insurance contracts, the examples, and the examples of transactions that are not considered as insurance contracts. For recognition and measurement, insurance companies are temporarily permitted under PFRS 4 pending the finalization of the phase two of IASB's project to continue developing their own accounting policies or continue using their existing accounting policies for insurance contracts without regards to the requirements of PES 8 accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and errors such as hierarchy of reporting standards and the conceptual framework. However, PFRS 4 expressly, letter A, prohibits provisions for possible claims under contracts that are not in existence at the reporting date referred to as catastrophe or equalization provisions. B, requires a test for the inadequacy of recognized insurance liabilities referred to as liability adequacy test. C, requires the retention of insurance liability in the statement of financial position until the obligation is distinguished, such as discharged or cancelled or expires. Letter D prohibits the offsetting of reinsurance assets against the related insurance liabilities or income or expense from reinsurance contracts against the expense or income from the related insurance contracts. And letter E requires an impairment test for reinsurance assets. Impairment loss is recognized when after the initial recognition of an insurance asset, an event has occurred that leads to amounts due under the contract not being recoverable in full and a reliable estimate of the loss can be assessed. Okay? So what do you mean by in liability adequacy test? Uh, this means that at each reporting period, an insurer shall assess whether its recognized liabilities are adequate using current estimates of future cash flows and related items such as handling costs arising under the insurance contracts. If the assessment shows that the carrying amount of the insurance liabilities 
less related deferred acquisition costs and related intangible assets is inadequate compared to the current estimate. The deficiency is recognized in profit or loss. Okay? So we have now this uh, very important uh, uh, issues, uh, terms that we have to consider in connection with our insurance contracts. So we have now your uh, uh, sp uh, changes in accounting policies. An insurer is permitted under PFRS 4 to change its accounting policies for insurance contracts if the change results to more relevant and no less reliable or more reliable and no less relevant financial information. The general principles in PES 8 shall be applied in judging relevance and reliability of financial information, but full compliance with the criteria in PES 8 is not required. Now we have the specific issues. Examples for changes in accounting policies. So letter A, current interest rates, okay? Then uh, B, continuation of existing practices. Uh, C, prudence. An insurer is not required to change its accounting policies for insurance contracts to eliminate future investment uh, for this. Uh, to eliminate excessive prudence. However, insurer that uses sufficient prudence is not required to introduce additional prudence. Then letter D, future investment margins. And letter E, shadow accounting, means that unrealized gains or losses on assets which are recognized in other comprehensive income are reflected in the measurement of the insurance liabilities or deferred acquisition costs or intangible assets in the same way as realized gains or losses. The related adjustment to the insurance liability or deferred acquisition cost or intangible assets shall be recognized in other comprehensive income if the unrealized gains or losses are also recognized in other comprehensive income. Okay, so we have now uh, a very important terms in connection with PFRS 4, we have to understand the meaning of discretionary participation feature. A contractual right to receive as a supplement to guaranteed benefits, additional benefits. And second, guaranteed element an obligation to pay guaranteed benefits included in a contract that contains a discretionary participation feature. And the last is guaranteed benefits. Payments or other benefits to which a particular policyholder or investor has an unconditional right that is not subject to the contractual discretion of the issuer. So these are now the uh, additional definitions. Uh, likewise, we have to understand the meaning of deposit component. 
a contractual component that is not accounted for as a derivative under PFRS 9 and would be within the scope of PFRS 9 if it were a separate instrument. So that's the passive component. Unbundle, unbundle spelling UN, B U N D L E, unbundle. Account for the components of a contract as if they were separate contracts. Unbundle. Uh, unbundling, unbundling is required when both the following conditions are met. So you are required uh, for unbundling. A, the deposit component can be measured separately. The deposit component can be measured separately without considering the insurance component. And B, the insurer's accounting policies does not require it to recognize all obligations and rights arising from the deposit component. Unbundling is permitted but not required. When the insurer can measure the deposit component separately from the insurance contract, but its accounting policies require it to recognize the deposit component. And bundling is permitted but not required when the insurer can measure the deposit component separately from the insurance contract. But its accounting policies require it to recognize the deposit component. And bundling is prohibited if an insurer cannot measure the deposit component separately. So unbundling is prohibited if an insurer cannot measure the deposit component separately. When a contract is unbundled, the insurer shall apply PFRS 4 to the insurance component and PFRS 9 to the deposit component. When a contract is unbundled, the insurer shall apply PFRS 4 to the insurance component and PFRS 9 to the deposit component. Okay, so we have now the so many, many terms and so many definitions for uh, insurance contracts and uh, the rest of this. Okay, uh, we have to classify our insurance into non-life. So we have non-life, no? And life. So for non-life, uh, non-life, damo ni, non-life include marine insurance, fire insurance, casualty insurance, motor insurance, motor insurance, uh, we have uh, motor insurance is included under casualty insurance. Casualty insurance in number three includes motor insurance, personal accident insurance, travel insurance, burglary, and theft insurance, burglary, B-U-R-G-L-A-R-Y, burglary, burglary, and theft insurance, okay? Then health insurance. So these are examples of casualty insurance. Then we have number four, number four, surety insurance, surety insurance. These are your examples of 
the non-life insurance. And of course, we have the life insurance. What are the types of life insurance? Term life insurance. Term, T-E-R-M. Term life insurance. Second, permanent life insurance. Permanent life insurance. Permanent life insurance includes letter A, whole life, whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole life coverage. Letter B, universal life coverage. Letter C, limited pay. Letter D, endowments. So we have your examples of permanent life insurance. Now, peculiar accounts and line items applicable to non-life insurance. So we have the assets. The assets uh, account titles are insurance receivable. Assets, insurance receivable. Uh, also, deferred acquisition cost, deferred acquisition cost, DAC. This DAC consists of deferred cost representing commissions. This consists of deferred cost representing commissions and other acquisition costs and other acquisition costs that vary with that vary with and are directly related that vary with and are directly related to securing new insurance contracts or renewing existing contracts. So we call this deferred acquisition costs. These are recoverable out of future premiums. They, these are recoverable out of future premiums. All other acquisition costs, all other acquisition costs are recognized as expense when incurred. All other acquisition costs are recognized as expense when incurred. Subsequently, these costs are amortized as expense using the 24th method, 24th, 2, 4, TH using the 24th method, except for contracts covering marine cargo risk, except for contracts covering marine cargo risks, where commissions for the last two months of the year are recognized as expense in the following year. Subsequently, these costs are amortized as expense using the 24th method, except for contracts covering marine cargo risks, where commissions for the last two months of the year are recognized as expense in the following year. DEC, or Deferred Acquisition Cost, is considered when performing the liability adequacy test at each reporting date. DEC is considered when performing the liability adequacy test at each reporting date. And uh, number three, under assets, reinsurance assets. Uh, representing the balances due from reinsurance companies. They are reviewed for impairment 
at each reporting period. So, in other words, for a non-life insurance, uh, the assets includes insurance receivable, deferred acquisition cost, and reinsurance assets. Now, for liabilities, for liabilities, we have insurance contracts liabilities insurance contract liabilities so liabilities number one insurance contracts liabilities including letter a provision for unearned premiums so provision for unearned premiums your premiums received but not yet expired Premiums received or collected but not yet expired. Then letter B, provision for claims reported and incurred but not reported. Provision for claims reported and incurred but not reported. Representing unpaid claims and related adjustment expenses arising from the occurrence of insured events. Whether or not these claims have been reported to the insurer. These provisions are based on the estimated ultimate cost of settling the claims. These do not include possible claims. These do not include possible claims for insured events that have not yet occurred. These provisions do not include possible claims for insured events that have not yet occurred as of the reporting date referred to as catastrophe or equalization provisions. Still included among the contract liabilities, letter C, provision for premium deficiency, representing additional liability for the deficiency in insurance contract liabilities arising from the performance of the liability adequacy test. Okay, still among the liability accounts is insurance payable. Insurance payable, letter A, uh, under insurance payable, letter A, due to reinsurers due to reinsurers representing premiums payable to reinsurers resulting from contracts ceded to them. So due to reinsurers and letter B, funds held for reinsurers. Funds held for reinsurers representing the portion of reinsurance premiums withheld by seeding companies in accordance with treaty agreements. Then, still included under liabilities, deferred reinsurance commissions. Deferred reinsurance commissions pertains to the unexpired portion of commissions from reinsurance contracts. These are recognized in profit or loss on the same basis as the related acquisition costs are recognized in profit or loss. So those are the three liability accounts in connection with insurance contracts. Then we go to revenue accounts. 
revenue accounts includes gross premiums. The total premiums receivable over the duration of insurance contracts written during the period. So consists of the total premiums receivable over the duration of insurance contracts written during the period, including adjustments made during the reporting period, including adjustments made during the reporting period, relating to contracts written in prior reporting periods. Gross premiums are recognized at the inception date of policies. Gross premiums are recognized at the inception date of policies. Premiums from short duration contracts are recognized as revenue over the period of the contracts using the 24th method except for contracts covering marine cargo risk where premiums for the last two months are considered earned in the following reporting period. The unexpired portion of premiums written are accounted for as provision for unearned premiums included in insurance contracts liabilities and presented in the liabilities section of the statement of financial position. The net changes in the provision for unearned premiums are accounted for as adjustments to the gross premium. Still under revenue, premium ceded to reinsurers consists of the total premiums payable over the duration of insurance contracts ceded to reinsurers. These include adjustments made during the reporting period relating to contracts ceded in prior reporting periods. Premiums ceded to reinsurers are recognized at the inception date of policies. Net premium is gross premium minus premiums ceded to reinsurers. Then we go to expenses. Expenses includes letter A, gross benefits and claims. Gross benefits and claims consist of all claims occurring during the period, whether reported or not, including direct cost of processing and settling the claims, reduced by salvage value and other recoveries, and adjusted for changes in claims outstanding from previous periods. B, claims ceded to in re Insurers, we are still under expenses. Claims ceded to reinsurers. The portion of claims occurring during the period which are recoverable from reinsurers. And C, net benefits and claims. Gross benefits and claims minus claims ceded to reinsurers. Some insurers present net benefits and claims in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income by reconciling the cash basis benefits and claims to accrual basis. This is done by adjusting the benefits and claims paid for the changes in insurance contracts liabilities. Okay, now I will give you a short example of the statement of financial 
position. I will give you a short example of the statement of financial position of an insurance company with the with assets liabilities and equity in uh, form no in uh, pro forma form so we now begin with the heading statement of financial position statement of financial position so the assets may include cash and cash equivalents the assets may include cash and cash equivalents okay cash and cash equivalents next held for trading securities held for trading securities next insurance receivable net insurance receivable net okay insurance receivable net next accrued income so that may be accrued income receivable okay assets accrued income then deferred acquisition cost then reinsurance assets and uh, may include property plant and equipment uh, anyway i'm just giving you a sample statement more accounts uh, may be added or uh, some accounts may be reduced so what's important is we are now uh, showing the treatment of the related accounts only in connection with uh, insurance contracts so there you will find insurance uh, receivable deferred acquisition cost and reinsurance assets so you'll get your total assets then among the liabilities you will include insurance contract liabilities accrued expenses and other liabilities you may include income tax payable insurance payables and deferred reinsurance commissions so there you will find insurance contract liabilities uh, insurance payables deferred reinsurance commissions and of course for the equity section you'll have your share capital retained earnings your uh, your uh, APIC, just like an ordinary equity section okay now for a sample uh, statement of profit or loss again in uh, pro forma form so your heading uh, name of the company statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income uh, as of the year ended so name of the company statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year ended so you have now your uh, of course if you have notes notes to the figures then you can just provide notes column gross premiums gross premiums then you may provide note number one gross premiums then provide note number one then you extend the amount of the gross premiums premium seeded to reinsurers note number one again uh, deduct premium seeded to reinsurers so gross premiums less premiums seeded to reinsurers the difference is net premiums difference is net premiums then we add fees and commission income and investment income 
and investment income. And you now get your total of other revenue. So you get the total revenue by adding your net premiums and your other revenue. You get your total revenue. Then from the total revenue, we have to uh, consider uh, the gross benefits and claims paid under the total revenue. We have now the gross benefits and claims paid. The gross benefits and claims paid. Then we have claims ceded to reinsurers. Uh, by the way, gross benefits and claims paid negative. Claims ceded to reinsurers positive. Claims ceded to reinsurers positive. Then you have your gross change in contract liabilities negative. Gross change in contract liabilities negative and change in contract liabilities ceded to reinsurers positive okay so we now get the uh, negative and the positive so for a difference so i'll repeat gross benefits and claims paid negative claims ceded to reinsurers positive Gross change in contract liabilities, negative. Change in contract liabilities, ceded to reinsurers, positive. So you have two positive and two negative. You now get the difference with these four items. The difference is net benefits and claims. Net benefits and claims. Okay? net benefits and claims so it's the net of the four amounts net benefits and claims okay it's the net of the four amounts then under net benefits and claims we are going to include finance cost finance cost 15 negative or finance cost negative and other operating and administrative expenses, negative. And other operating and uh, administrative expenses, negative. Okay? So you have negative, negative. So what will happen now? You have your uh, difference will be your net other expenses that's the sum of your finance cost and your other operating and admin expenses so you have now your other expenses so you get of course that's negative so you now get the total benefits claims and other expenses the total benefits, claims, and other expenses. So you will be adding your net benefits and claims, negative, and your uh, other expenses. So you now get a negative result. Total benefits, claims, and other expenses. You deduct that from the total revenue you deduct that from the total revenue so you get the profit before tax and then profit before tax you deduct your income tax the difference is profit for the year profit for the year down you will include other comprehensive income after tax other comprehensive income after tax. You may include items that will not be reclassified subsequently to profit or loss. Items that will not be 
reclassified subsequently to profit or loss. So example, gain on property revaluation. Gain on property revaluation. So that's your other comprehensive income. And you get the total. That will be your total uh, comprehensive income for the year. Total comprehensive income for the year. What are we going to include in our note one? In line with gross premiums and premiums ceded to reinsurers. What do we include in gross premium and premium ceded to reinsurers? So we have now our a note six to determine our net premiums. So we begin with gross premiums written. Gross premiums written. Direct gross premiums written. Direct and assume. Gross premiums written includes direct and assumed. Assumed. So you have now your total gross premiums on insurance contracts. Then we are going to include the change in provision for unearned premiums. The change in provision for unearned premiums, which we may deduct. So you get the gross premiums. Okay, that will be extended with gross premiums, line one, note one. Note, okay, note one. Then for premium ceded to reinsurers, we have negative premium ceded to reinsurers. Then the change in provision for unearned premiums, positive. So negative and positive, we have the premiums ceded to reinsurers. You now get your net premiums. Okay? So what are included in direct premiums? Uh, in our gross premium computation, we have direct premiums, premiums received or receivable directly from brokers, agents or insured individuals before deducting premiums paid or payable to reinsurers. Assume premiums, premiums received or receivable from other insurance companies for reinsurance contracts written. And finally, premiums ceded to reinsurers Direct and assume premiums paid or payable to reinsurers for reinsurance contracts obtained. Now this is, uh, uh, we have the sample problem in connection with, we have the sample statement of financial position and we have the statement uh, of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Okay, so we now go to, I'd like to discuss one very important method and that is the 24th method. The 24th method. Most insurance contracts issued by non-life Insurance companies are of short duration, normally one year. Premiums for these types of contracts are recognized as revenue over the period of the contracts using the 24th method, except for contracts covering marine cargo risks. The unexpired portion of premiums written are accounted for as provision for unearned premiums included in insurance contracts, liabilities, and presented in the liability 
section of the statement of financial position. The net changes in the provision for unearned premiums are accounted for as adjustments to the gross premium recognized in profit or loss for the period. The 24th method assumes that the average rate of issue of all policies written during any month is the middle of that month. So the average date of issue of all policies is the middle of that month. Now, we will have one illustrative problem with regards to the 24th method uh, and then uh, after that um, we have to take up the multiple choice problems and questions in uh, theory in chapter 22 however what i will be doing is to post this solution in the canvas so you can see the solutions to chapter 22 a multiple choice problems and theory of the young okay so just refer to the canvas so for the meantime let's have the illustrative problem uh, for on january 1 20 x1 a insurance company issued a one year fire insurance contract for a total premium of 12,000. So on January 1, 20X1, a insurance company issues a one-year fire insurance contract for a total premium of 12,000. Required letter A, how much are the earned portions of the premium for the months ended January 31, February 28th and March 31, respectively. How much are the earned portions of the premiums for the months ended January 31, February 28th and March 31, respectively? B. How much are the unearned portions of the premium for the months ended January 31, February 28th and March 31, respectively. C. How much is the earned portion of the premium for the year ended December 31, 20X1? D. How much is the unearned portion of the premium for the year ended December 31? E. Provide for the journal entries on January 1 to recognize the gross premium and the adjusting entry on December 31 to recognize the adjustment to the gross premium. Now let's start with requirement 1, the earned portion of the premium. For the months January 31, February 28, and March 31. Now, the gross premium, we create three columns January 31, February 28, and March 31. These are the months in the first quarter of the year. So, we have now for the first quarter. January 31, February 28, and March 31. We multiply this by January 31. We multiply by 1 over 24, February 28, by 2 over 24, and for March 31, again, by 2 over 24. So what do you get when you now uh, multiply 12,000 by 1 over 24? So the earned portion by January 31, 500, February 28, 1,000, and March 31, 
1,000. So, earned portion, January 31, 500. That's taken by the, by multiplying 12,000 by 1 over 24. So, earned portion, January 31, 500. February 28, 1,000. March 31, 1,000. Under the 24th method, it is assumed that the average date of issue of all policies during any month is the middle of that month. Therefore, in January, date of issue, one issues in the numerator equal to one half month. And uh, we have now uh, in the succeeding months, the numerator is two equal to the whole month. So we have now your answers in requirement A. In requirement B, for the unearned portion, for January 31, we have 23 over 24. February 28, we have 21 over 24. And for March 31, that's 19 over 24. So 19 over 24. The unearned portions by January 31 is 11,500. By February 28 is 10,500. And by March 31, 9,500. So that makes total of, uh, you may add the earned to the unearned. You get 12,000. The numerators in the fractions are determined as follows. January 31, 24 minus 1, uh, earned, so you have unearned. February 28, 24 minus 1 earned in January, earned in February, so you get 21. On March 31, we deduct 24 minus 1 minus 2 minus 2, so you now get the unearned of 19. Okay, now in requirement letter C, determine the earned portion of December 31, 20X1. And the gross premium is 12,000. We multiply this by uh, the earned portion, 23 over 24. So the earned portion is still uh, 11,500. While the unearned portion is 500. That's by December 31, 20X1. So for the requirements of the journal entries, by January 1, we debit to insurance receivable, 12,000 and credit gross premium revenue, 12,000. On December 31, 20X1, we have the debit to change in provision for unearned premiums for 500 and credit provision for unearned premiums by 500. The change in provision for unearned premiums is recognized in profit or loss as an adjustment to gross premiums to compute for the earned portion. The provision for unearned premiums is presented in the statement of financial position as part of insurance contract liabilities. So gross premium earned will be disclosed in the notes as follows. Gross premiums written 12,000, then we have to deduct the change in provision, gross premiums earned is 11,500, okay? 
So we now have uh, the gross premiums earned. Notice that the method of recording used is the income method as opposed to the liability method. Alternatively, the adjusting entry may also be made by directly reducing the gross premiums revenue account as shown below. So you may debit gross premiums revenue direct 500 and credit provisions for unearned premiums by 500. The previous entries as required in letter E, we are required to prepare entries on January 1 to recognize the gross premium and adjusting entry on December 31 to recognize the adjustment to gross premium. So the entries for requirement letter E on January 1, debit 2, insurance receivable, direct 12,000 and credit gross premiums revenue, direct for 12,000. The adjusting entry on December 31 is to debit change in provision for unearned premiums change in provision for unearned premiums 500 and credit provisions for unearned premium for 500. So those are the entries that we have by using the 24th method. Uh, another problem in connection with the 24th method is when the policy is issued uh, during the period. Well, the first problem is when the policy was issued at the beginning of the period. So next problem, in March 20X1, a insurance company issues a one-year fire insurance contract for a total premium of 12000 Requirements, how much is the earned portion of the premium for the year ended December 31, 20X1? B, how much is the unearned portion of the premium for the year ended December 31, 20X1? So A, how much is the earned portion? And B, how much is the unearned portion? The earned portion by December 31 is computed as gross premium 12,000. We multiply by 19 over 24. 19 over 24. So the earned portion by December 31 is 9,500. The numerator in the fraction is 19 and it's computed as follows. 1 earned in March, 2 earned in April, 2 December. So that would mean 1 plus 2 times 9. You count April to December, you have 9 months. Okay? So 1 earned in March plus 2 times 9. So 1 plus 2 times 9. You get 1 plus 18. So you now get a total of 19. 1 plus 2 times 9. You get total of 19. So the gross premium of 12,000, you multiply that by 19 over... 24, you get the earned portion by December 31 equal to 9,500. In letter B, how much is the unearned portion by December 31, 20X1? So the gross premium, 12,000, you multiply by 5 over 24. The unearned portion is 2,500. Five is taken by deducting 19 from 24. 
5 is taken by deducting 19 from 24. So in that case, your unearned portion is equal to uh, uh, 2,500. Okay, we go to problem number three, still under the uh, 24th method, premium seeded. In April 20X1, a insurance company writes fire insurance policies for a total premium of 36,000. During the same period, total premiums of 12,000 were ceded to reinsurers. Okay, requirement. Compute for the following. A, net premium earned for the year ended December 31, 20X1, and B, balance of provision for unearned premiums as of December 31, 20X1. Solution to letter A, net premium earned for December 31, 20X1. The gross premium is 36,000. Then we multiply this by 17 over 24. 17 over 24. Okay? So the earned portion on December 31, 20 X1 is 25,500. That's the earned portion by December 31, 20 X1. For the premium seeded, we now get 12,000 multiplied by 17 over 24. 17 over 24. So you get the earned portion by reinsurers on December 31, 20X1 of 8,500. Then the net premium earned is on December 31, 20X1 is 25,500 minus 8,500. The net premium earned is 17,000. Requirement B, compute for the provision for an earned premium by December 31, 20X1. Gross premium, 36,000 multiplied by 7 over 24. So the unearned portion is 10,500. The premium seeded of 12,000 deduct or multiply 12,000 by 7 over 24. You get the unearned portion by the reinsurers equal to 3,500. Now, 3,500 deducted from 10,500, you get the difference of uh, 7,000. You get the difference of 7,000. Okay? So that's your uh, amounts to be considered as provision for unearned premiums. How did we get 17 over 24? That's taken by adding 1 plus the product of 2 times 8. 1 plus the product of 2 times 8, that will give you 17 months. So 17 over 24. Okay, so that's all for our insurance and for the solutions to the problems in chapter 22. Uh, I will just post it sa canvas. So numbers 1 to 30 and then numbers 31 to uh, 51.
Okay? So, God bless you on Monday. Uh, hoping that if we we can have the exam by 10.30. But if not, then I'll uh, uh, have it at 11. 11 up to 1.30. So, God bless us all. Record, eh? Oh. Huh? Oh. Wala? Wala record. Oh, okay, Imagine discuss twenty five.